Our Gospel reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke. It is the, the story, uh, the so-called story of the sending out of the 70, some translations say the 72. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us through these words. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest upon that person, but if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of our of the town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. The word of the Lord. You're sitting in your home, reading a magazine, and you notice them on the other side of the road on the sidewalk coming down, going door to door, and they're, they're nicely dressed young folks, and you immediately recognize they're Jehovah's Witnesses or, or maybe Mormons, and they're going door to door, as I said, sharing their faith, but, but you've spotted them long before they get to your house. So what, wait, what do you do? Well, I'll admit that on occasions I flip the light off and move to the couch, which can't be seen from outside through the window. And when the doorbell rings, I just sit there. I'm not trying to be mean, not trying to be rude, but I just don't want them to know that I'm there. When I was in seminary, I was part of a, a group imaginatively known as the Theology Discussion Group. And we met every Friday afternoon at a, a local pub and would enjoy a couple of drinks and discuss an article that one of us had copied and put in a folder labeled Theology Discussion Group that sat on the main desk at the library. And this little group was shepherded by Doug O'Toddy, um, a, prof a theology professor whom I dearly love and, and who introduced me to the joys of single malt stock. <laughs> and one of those Fridays, Doug and I were standing on the sidewalk just outside this pub when two Jehovah's Witnesses came down the sidewalk. They were out going door to door and what was, with the exception of this one little short half block where the pub and a dry cleaner and a hardware store and a beauty parlor were, was otherwise a residential neighborhood. And so quick, what to do? Do you jump back into the pub or do we dive into Doug's ancient VW Bug which was parked right there at the curb? But instead, Doug walked straight over to them. And he engaged them in conversation for the longest time, talking about their doctrines. He even got a couple of tracks for them and gave them a few bucks in exchange. 
And as we got in his car and he handed me the tracks and we drove off talking about this, it became apparent that this was his standard way of dealing with such an encounter. And I really don't know whether the fact that he grew up the child of immigrant Brazilian and Italian parents in Tenafly, New Jersey, had anything to do with the way he treated folks like that or not. I just don't know. But you know, I really, it's hard for me to understand why it is that some events in your life just stick with you and others are so easily forgotten. You know, I've had plenty of moments in my life that at the time seemed like they were thrilling or moving, and yet I have the most difficult time retrieving them from the deep recesses of memory, if I can retrieve them at all. But this mundane event with my professor is right there at the surface, always there, always easily recalled. But Maybe it's not such a mundane event. It is, after all, about something dear to the Bible. And that is how one treats the stranger. You know, most of us as Christians are aware that the Bible tells us to love our neighbors. But we seem a little less informed on the fact that the Bible commands us even more frequently to love the stranger. I ran across something in a book I was reading the other day, a, a quote from uh, Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief rabbi of England, who wrote that the Hebrew Scriptures in one verse command us, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But in no fewer than 36 places, command us to love the stranger. Now, I haven't checked up his map. I haven't counted to see. But that sounds about right to me. And his list doesn't even include our New Testament. I know a lot of us grew up in a time and a place when Christian church was respected and had lots of influence. And so it may be difficult for us to relate to this Bible, the Bible's emphasis on the stranger. But for ancient Israel, who lived in a time when safe travel often depended on the hospitality of strangers, who had escaped slavery in Egypt, who had been hauled off to exile in Babylon, who for most of their history had been this little tiny state at the mercy of large empires around them. They were acutely aware of what it meant to be a sojourner, a wanderer, a stranger, at the mercy of others. And the very first Christians were equally so as, as Jews. They were certainly well accustomed to the Jewish notion of being a stranger. And as they started to go out and share the message, to take that message out into the world, they traveled to places where there was no one like them. And as they began to get excluded from the synagogue, they found themselves even more strange. And as Jesus gives his instructions when he sends out his followers in our lessons today, he, he reflects this status that they have. And I find it intriguing that the only litmus test Jesus gives for those who the missionaries will encounter is whether or not they show wealth. In other words, whether or not they love these Christian strangers. 